Let it be with me according to your word. Let it be with me according to your word. Our passages today serve as a nice bridge between the early Advent readings about the end of the world and what we'll hear tonight and tomorrow about Jesus' birth. David wants to build God a house so that God's presence has somewhere nice and permanent to stay. God has objections to this, but we don't hear those specifics this morning. Rather, however, God promises that David himself will create a house. From this house of David, the Messiah will be born. The lectionary is getting us ready for Jesus' birth narrative. As we jump from Mark to Luke to John, over last week to this to next. This morning we hear the angel coming to Mary, letting her know that God has chosen her if she's willing to accept it. Mary, a normal girl living in the country, has been chosen, chosen to bring life into the world. Jesus. Not only will Mary bring Jesus' life into the world through his birth, Mary brings life itself, life abundant to the world. God promises David that he will have a lineage and that the Savior of Israel will be born through that lineage. Joseph is a descendant of David and the house of David. Despite Joseph not playing a biological role in Jesus' conception and birth, still the Savior of creation is born into his house. Born into the lineage of David, born to live in Joseph's house, a house we can assume is full of love from an adoptive father. There are some complications with Jesus potentially being born with Mary and Joseph betrothed, but not married. The angel assures Mary that her sister, who is considered barren, is six months pregnant herself. For nothing will be impossible with God. Hearing that God has a plan for Mary, for Jesus to come into the world, for the Son of God to be born and to bring life into the world, Mary says yes to God. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Nothing is impossible with God who chooses the lowly to accomplish God's mission and who casts down the mighty from their thrones, rejecting the existence of those human thrones when choosing to come into the world. Last week we prayed together what God is doing in Jesus coming to the world. We prayed how God's elevation of the lowly is a part of God carrying out God's mission for the reconciliation of all things. We prayed Mary's song last week. God has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Mary's song, sung just after today's passage from Luke and offered as an option for the response last week and this, is no more a to-do list for us than are the Beatitudes. I hope we find inspiration in the work God is doing and has done through God's work in Jesus, but in the best of Advent themes, Mary's song lives in the already, not yet. 
The work God has accomplished in Jesus is work to which we are joined when we're baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection and when we're given the gift of the Spirit. The work Mary elevates in the Magnificat is a song of longing and hope. It's gratitude for what God has done and is doing. It's longing and hoping for the day when that work is completed and all things are restored to right relationship and perfect unity with God. For nothing will be impossible with God is important for us to hear as we go into a year that is right now about $66,000 short between ideal budget and pledges. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Is what the bishop's committee is going to be praying at a special retreat on Epiphany when we plan next year's budget and managing coverage and priorities for my going on sabbatical. We have a lot to do that we can't fit into a one-hour monthly meeting. Looking at the work God has done in Jesus doesn't mean that we live in fantasy lands and ignore the shortcomings of the world around us. The hope we know in Advent, the hope of the Magnificat, the hope of the resurrection is one that longs for God to accomplish God's plans and to give us bread for the journey for our parts too. So yes, our budget right now is $66,000 short. We'll adjust our sales to deal with that. And you all, we all pledged $50,000 for our three-year new wineskins capital campaign. We were only aiming for $35,000. A significant number of pledges for next year have gone up, and for that I am immediately and immensely grateful. The people represented in our pledges, when we move from particular pledges, or what used to be called potential pledging units, whoa, to people represented by pledges, is 20 people more than our average Sunday attendance. The shortcomings of the world around us are not your shortcomings, and I don't want anyone to hear that, not individually or collectively. Rather, the shortcomings of the world around us are opportunities for us to take the good news of Jesus and the hope of Mary and Advent to the longing and hurting, to the hungry and humble, and assure them that this isn't the end. This isn't the way it always will be. As we wind down the season of Advent, the season of beginnings, and wind down 2023, I have hope and know that we have discernment to do. We haven't been called to carry Jesus to term and give birth. We are, however, discerning our calls for being Jesus' body in the world. I have hope. Let it be with me according to your word. Amen.